He said, hold fast to the gospel, hold fast to God, trust in Him, not in a person, not in me, not in an activity, not in anything, but the gospel. So it was Monday, January 2nd. The Buffalo Bills were playing the Cincinnati Bengals in one of the most anticipated Monday night football games that would happen toward the end of the season. It was a game that would help complete the NFL playoff picture. And many of you at this point may have already seen a video of the things that ensued at about 8, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time that night. Cincinnati had the ball. Joe Burrow completed a pass to wide receiver T. Higgins. And safety, the safety on the Buffalo Bills, Damar Hamlin tackled T. Higgins. It was as far as NFL football games go, a normal tackle, it seemed to be. Hamlin stands up from the tackle for a moment and then collapses right on the field with what we now know was a cardiac arrest. What ensued was a scene that most in football have never seen. Hamlin was resuscitated while still on the field. Then again in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Players were stunned. Some were even crying. After medical personnel worked on Hamlin for close to an hour, right there on the field, the game was eventually postponed for the evening and ultimately canceled for the season. The situation rocked the football world. Analysts across all the networks talked about praying for DeMar Hamlin and praying for the other players, praying for the Buffalo Bills, praying for all of football. Then on Tuesday, the following day, a football analyst and a former player by the name of Dan Orlovsky, while discussing the Hamlin situation on an ESPN TV show, did something that the other analysts had only suggested. He prayed. Right there on national television, he bowed his head, closed his eyes, and he prayed for DeMar Hamlin. He prayed for strength for DeMar. He prayed for the Buffalo Bills. He prayed for the Cincinnati Bengals. He, he prayed for T. Higgins. He prayed for football at large. And he claimed on ESPN, on national television, that he believes in the power of prayer. You see, until that moment, Dan Orlovsky was known in the world as a football player, a former football player, but a football player and a football analyst. But when he prayed, his message revealed his true identity. His message revealed what he trusts. His message revealed what he believes in. His message revealed that he believes in Christ that he believes in the power of prayer. You see, our identity is who we are at our core, isn't it? Our identity is where we find our value. But how do we know someone's identity? How do we understand it? How do we learn it? Well, someone's identity is found when you listen to their message, isn't it? I mean, it's found when you hear what it is that they are trusting in. It, it's found when you hear what they want others to trust. You see, Dan Orlovsky had been a relatively outspoken follower of Christ throughout his career. Some knew that he followed Christ, but most knew him as a football analyst and a former quarterback. He was in the conversation because of what he knew about football. But what he did was that he used his knowledge of football. He used his position, he used his place to have the right to reveal his true identity as a follower of Jesus. I have a question. A question for us today. If someone listens to us, if someone listens to you for a week, what would they say is our identity? What would your identity be if someone listens to you? What would they say? That's where they find their value. What would they say is your message? Well, this is our topic today. Our identity in the gospel, our identity in this message of Jesus Christ, this one message that we've been given to proclaim across the world. And our focus this year is just that. It's this one message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. And last year, we spent the year talking about one story, reading through a Bible plan and aligning our weekend series with all of that reading. This year, our theme, our focus is 
one message, not one story. We'll spend the year talking about what it looks like for us to live the gospel, what it looks like for us to share it with other people. We'll talk about practical steps on how to do it, what it looks like, how can we live it, all of those things. And throughout the year, we'll have 12 different initiatives generally aligning with the 12 months of the year, but 12 initiatives. And the first one we're in right now, it's a prayer and fasting initiative where we're gonna ask God for a heart of evangelism. Each day, thank him for who he is. Thank him for what he's done in our lives and done for us. And then ask him to give us a passion for this one message to give us boldness to share the message of Jesus. And as we go throughout our day, we're being challenged to fast from various things each week for whatever amount of time that we decide we'd like to do. But as we fast from those things that we otherwise would be doing, that's when we pray. That's when we thank God. That's when we ask him to do something special in our lives, in our church, in our community this year through this theme of the one message. And so you can get all kinds of information at visitgracechurch.com slash one message. And the beginning of the year, way back on January 1st, three weeks ago, it's hard to believe that it's been that long right now. We kicked off the year and this theme with a new series entitled The Power of the Gospel. And today we're in the last week of this series. Week one, we talked about the message of the gospel, the fact that Jesus died and then he rose. That's the message of the gospel. Week two, last week, we talked about the hope of the gospel, the the fact that Jesus is our hope. And today we're talking, as I said, about the identity, our identity in the gospel. The fact, who are we? Our identity. And our theme for this entire series has been Romans chapter one, verse 16, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul says the gospel of Christ is the power of God. And when we want power in our life, we have to go back to the gospel. It's where the power in our life starts. It's where our walk with God starts, at the gospel. So let's pray, and then we're gonna jump in to our text today. We're gonna be in 1 Corinthians chapter two. If you'd like to go ahead and turn there, and we will pray and jump in. Father, we thank you so much for all that you are. Lord, thank you for this book. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the power of the gospel in our lives and for what it means for us. And Lord, I pray that uh, right now you would guide and direct my words and my lips. Lord, help me not to rely on, as the text that we're gonna be studying today says, that I don't rely on any wisdom of men, that I don't rely on any ability or persuasive words in and of myself, but that today we see the power of your Holy Spirit at work through me and in our lives. Lord, would you be glorified, would you be honored, and would you do what you have have planned and would like to do in each heart that's hearing this today? We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're gonna be, as I said, in 1 Corinthians chapter two, and we're gonna be seeing three things today about our our identity in the gospel. The first thing that we can learn from, I, I believe, from this text in 1 Corinthians two is this. Here's our first point. Paul's message was Jesus and the cross. Paul's message was Jesus and the cross. That was Paul's identity. Let's pick it up in verse one of chapter two. Paul says this, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Paul said, I did not come with excellent oratory to you. I didn't come to you with intricately prepared messages. I didn't come with this great wisdom of my own. I didn't come telling you how much I knew or how much wisdom I had. And Paul had tons of wisdom. Paul had tons of knowledge about the Old Testament, about Judaism. He was a Pharisee. He had been trained in Old Testament doctrine and Old Testament teaching. But Paul said, I didn't come to share with you all the knowledge that I knew. So have you ever been around someone that consistently wants to tell us everything they know? Almost as though though they need us to know what they know, right? Does does someone come to mind? Maybe a face flashed across your, your, your mind right now. But sometimes we do this when we're in new situations, don't we? Sometimes we do this when people don't really know our qualifications or 
don't really know where we came from or what we know, we sometimes inadvertently do it. And Paul's qualifications were immaculate. I mean, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew what he was talking about. But he didn't want to come to them trying to show them how much knowledge he had. Instead, let's look at verse 2 to see what he did come with. He says in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I determined. And that, that word determined, we think about it and when we use it, it's like, I'm going to decide I'm going to do something. I'm determined. This will happen. But in this context, it means resolved or decided. So it could say, Paul says, I decided, I resolved not to know anything among you. Paul says, I resolved, I decided to, I've reached a decision about a course of action. I decided that I wasn't going to make this conversation about the things that I knew. Paul says, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not going to talk about my hobbies. I'm not going to talk about the latest, the, 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 the latest model of chariot that might be out. He said, I resolved that I'm going to have one message. I'm going to have one message. And that one message was Jesus Christ and his cross. He determined, he resolved that he would talk to people about normal everyday things. That would be fine. But then ultimately, he would talk to them about his one message, about the message of Jesus. And we saw Paul do this in Acts chapter 17 at Athens at a place called Mars Hill. Paul heard about and looked around the culture and realized that they had an idol to the unknown God. And Paul said to them in Mars Hill, he said, this, this, this idol that you worship, the unknown God, I know who this unknown God is. So he used culture and what he observed in culture. And then he said, let me tell you about the unknown God. Let me tell you about this one named Jesus. And it isn't wrong or bad to have knowledge about culture. It isn't wrong or bad to talk about politics or any other topic that we are interested in or have knowledge about. But what message have we ultimately decided that we will talk about? Have we decided that in the context of all other conversations that we have, we are resolved, we are determined that ultimately we'll talk about the one message that we have, that ultimately we'll talk about Jesus and his cross. As this, this, this point is so convicting for me. And I think we want to do this. It just takes focus. It takes a determination. It takes a decision. It takes a resolve. And ultimately, it shows our true identity. You see, it, it shows the thing that we value. It shows the thing that we believe, that we love. It, and the thing that we love is often the thing that we talk about. The thing in which we find our value, the thing in which we find our identity is often the thing we talk about often. That's what Paul was saying. And Paul came to the Corinthians preaching this one thing. He said, the Messiah has come. Jesus Christ is here. And the one that you've been waiting for has come, God in the flesh. And not only has, has he come, but he's been crucified for you. He's been crucified because he loves you. So here's our question again. What have we decided that we will know among people? Put another way, what do we resolve will be our message? Have we decided that our one message, that in a group or in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that we will resolve to talk about Jesus? That yes, we'll have other conversation, but ultimately we're determined to talk about him. Or are we determined to talk about our hobbies or our kids or our grandkids or career, politi politics, or how, how big a mess our world is in. And all of those may be true, and all of those things are, are valid topics. But do we use those things to help us relate so that ultimately we can talk about Jesus and his crucifixion, and Jesus and his resurrection? You see, Paul had that one message. His entire focus was on Jesus Christ and his cross. So not only can we see that Paul's one message was Jesus and the cross, but another thing that we can learn from this text is that Paul was confident in the spirit, not his ability. 
Paul was confident in the spirit, not his ability. His identity was in the gospel, not in any wisdom or any ability that he had. Look what he says in verse three. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. (laughs) Can you relate to this? Paul, in the context of telling people about Jesus, said, okay, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. How many of us have decided, I'm gonna tell someone about Jesus? And at the moment, we get weak need, we get afraid, we get physically tired, we get fearful, we're shaking, all of these things. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul being in that condition? The Apostle Paul who knew so much about Scripture, who knew Jesus, who saw Jesus. The Apostle Paul felt the same things that you and I sometimes feel when we are faced with sharing this one message of Jesus. Butterflies in his stomach, maybe concerned about how he would sound or what would others think, wondering, what what will I say? What if I mess up? What if I don't say it right? All of those same questions that sometimes you and I ask, Paul had those. He said, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And then in verse four, he says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul said, I didn't have everything figured out. I didn't have all the answers to every argument in my head figured out. I didn't have it flow charted. I didn't have it documented. I was ready. That's not the way I came to you. I didn't come with my own wisdom. He says, do you know what my speech and my preaching was marked by? It was a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Do you know what Paul trusted when he was telling people about Jesus? It wasn't what he knew. It wasn't, it wasn't his knowledge. It wasn't his experience. It wasn't his wisdom. His, it wasn't his ability to develop an argument. He trusted the power of the spirit of God to give him the words to say, just like God asks you and me to do. He trusted the power of the spirit to move in the lives of people he was talking to. You see, Paul found his identity in the power of God's spirit. He found his identity in the gospel and he didn't place his confidence in his ability, in his wisdom, in his his oratory or anything. He placed his confidence in the spirit of God. Now, does this mean we shouldn't try to convince or persuade people about the gospel? Is that what Paul's saying? He says, I didn't come with, uh, with persuasive words of man's wisdom. Does that mean we shouldn't try to persuade? No, that's not what it means. Let's jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 11. Now, the, the verses leading up to verse 11, the context of it is a time called the, seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And it's a, it's a time when every follower of Jesus, every believer will stand before Jesus and give account for our behavior, for our actions and so forth, the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul says in verse 11, in the context of that, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences. Paul says, because we know that one day we're gonna stand before him, at the judgment seat of Christ, because we know the terror involved in that, the terror that's involved in standing before him. Now, when I think of the word terror, you know the image that comes to mind? It's like a haunted house, right? (laughs) Like the terror, Get get that mental image. But this word terror here isn't that kind of terror, I don't believe. I believe it's the same word used in other places translated as fear. It's the same word. It's a reverence for how mighty and powerful that God is. It produces this healthy reverence, this healthy fear, this healthy terror, this positive terror that motivates us to an action, that motivates us to tell other people. And Paul says, knowing that one day we're gonna stand before him, we persuade men because we know what's coming. We persuade men because we know what's coming for us that one day we're gonna stand before him and we're gonna give account for what we do and what we say and how we live. And one day everyone we know will stand before him and give account. Because of that, we're persuaded to tell men. Because of that, we communicate Jesus and who he is. And Paul goes on in verse 14 and he gives another reason to tell people and persuade them. He says, for the love of Christ 
compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Not only do we do it because one day we will all stand before him, but we also do it because we are compelled by the love of Christ. Do you know why we persuade people about the gospel? Because the love of Jesus compels us. Some versions say constrains. It means the same thing. We cannot help but tell people about Jesus. We're obliged to tell others about this message of Jesus Christ because we know the love of Christ in our own lives, because we know that Jesus died for everyone, because we know that everybody needs the life that Jesus offers us. So let's talk about this idea of compelled for a minute. So imagine with me for a minute that someone comes to you and they say, for every person that you go talk to about this topic, whatever this topic is, pick it, right? Whatever, how, whoever you talk to, I'm gonna give you $100,000 and I'm gonna give, give them $100,000. Wow, well, all you have to do, you just have to tell them about this topic. You get 100 grand, they get 100 grand, every person you talk to. What would you do? Well, you would be compelled to tell people about that topic, wouldn't you? I'd be telling everybody, right? Why? Well, we'd be telling everybody because we benefit by it. We'd be telling everybody because it benefits everybody else. That's the message of Jesus. That is the one message. We are compelled to tell other people because he loves us so much. And when we tell other people, it benefits us because we communicate and he works through us and he speaks through us. And when we tell other people, it benefits them because they realize the love that God has for them. The love of God compels us to tell other people. Paul goes on in chapter five, verse 20. It's a, a verse that we spent a little bit of time in last week, but here's what it says. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God pleads through us. Paul didn't have confidence in, his, in, in, in him, himself. He had confidence in the spirit of God. That's what he had confidence in. It wasn't in his ability. That's what he says here. God pleads through us. We don't have to come up with the words. We don't have to come up with the, the actions or the arguments or any of it. It's God speaking through us imploring, begging others to give him a chance, begging others to accept him and to follow him. Be reconciled to God. You see, we're ambassadors for God as God works through us. So Paul was confident in the spirit, not in his ability. So we've learned that Paul's one message was Jesus and the cross. We've learned that Paul was confident in the spirit, not his ability. The third thing that we can learn is this. Paul wanted people to trust God, not him. Paul wanted people to trust God, not him. His identity, Paul's identity was in God. It wasn't in himself and it wasn't in anyone else. Let's jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter two, where we started today. It says in verse five, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul tells us here why he didn't wanna use persuasive words. You see, if he had used persuasion and wisdom of his own, it would have given him glory, wouldn't it? You know, I, I was reminded by the phrase, uh, you know, if I can talk you into something, at some point someone will come after me who's smarter and a better talker and they'll be able to talk you out of it and into something else, right? But here's the point Paul's making. He says, I, I want your faith to not be in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He's saying, if God does the work, God gets the glory. You see, if God speaks through us and uses us to reach other people, he gets the glory for what happens. Don't find your identity in anything but God. Trust God with your life and with your eternity. Because our identity has to be found in the gospel. That's where we find our value. It's where we find our worth. It's where we find our identity. Paul says later in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 15.1, he says, <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Paul says, I declared to you the gospel. 
I didn't declare my wisdom, my thoughts, my opinions. I declared the gospel. And some of you received it. Just like some of you today listening to me right now. You've received the gospel. You've received the gospel and the message of Jesus. You know you're on your way to heaven. Paul continues in verse two and he says, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul says, this gospel I have declared, it's your way to salvation. If you believe what I preached, this message of the gospel, you'll be saved. And some of you listening to me today need to believe this today. You need to make this your belief. You need to accept it. You need to to take this step. Some of you need to do what Paul said here and hold fast. You need to take it as yours. You hold it in possession. That's what that word, that phrase hold fast means. Hang on to it. You cling to it. You get a hold of it instead of hanging on to everything else in the world that's empty and that will fail us. Hold fast to the message of Jesus Christ. And Paul says that if you make the gospel your own, you'll be saved. He wanted people to trust in God, not in him. He said, hold fast to the gospel, hold fast to God, trust in him, not in a person, not in me, not in an activity, not in anything, but the gospel. You trust in him. You know, back to the Damar Hamlin situation that we're all likely very familiar about right now. There's another previous football player that revealed his true identity in the context of all of this. And his name was Benjamin Watson. He was on a national news show on CNN. And the host was, uh, it was having a conversation with Watson back and forth about uh, this topic of, of Hamlin. And the topic turned to the frailty of life. And Watson began his message. He said along the lines of something like this, that we all have mortality and we all have an appointment with death. And Watson went on and he said, times like this, when things like this happen, it forces us to ask what our next steps will be as we face mortality. In those times, we have to ask ourselves, what if it was me lying on that field or lying in this situation, wondering about my eternity or my next steps? It forces us to ask, where will we spend eternity? And he goes on and he says, the amazing thing is that God provides an answer through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, in that moment, his message was the gospel. He showed his true identity. His identity was the gospel. So let me ask you this question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Have you accepted, are you holding fast to this gospel, to this one message? Is it where you find your identity, your worth? Is it where you find who you are? If you don't know him, if you've not accepted him as your savior, accept him today. Jesus says, if you admit that you can't do anything to get to heaven, if you accept me as your savior, if you believe that I came, I died, I rose again, and if you just tell me that that you want me to be your savior, he says, I'll save you. If you do know him, what's your one message? Is it Jesus on the cross? Are you finding your confidence in the power of God's spirit? Or are you finding your confidence in your ability and your wisdom and all of the, the, the giftedness that you have? And do you trust in God or are you trusting in other people? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for this book. Thank you for its truth. Thank you for what it does in our lives, what it means in our lives and Lord, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the fact that he died for us and that he rose again. He's alive right now and he works and moves in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would do in our lives and in our hearts what you'd like done. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Man, we hope it was encouraging to you. We hope you're blessed. If you'd like more information about what it means to have your identity in the gospel, to, what it, to know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We would love to help you with that. Just go to visitgracechurch.com slash next step. 
until we meet again next time, remember that we love you. More importantly, Jesus loves you and he wants you to live outward focus this week. Skeptical inside, making promises We both know our lies But there's no need for pride When surrender wins the fight With victory in my bones I'll be singing till morning comes My heart can find its courage Cause I know Even when the night comes I'm not scared Cause even when the night comes I know you'll be there even when the night comes, my heart fails I know, I know you'll always be there Even when the night comes Your love is higher, your love is stronger Your love is greater so what do I have to fear?